Hi, and welcome to The State of Work, the podcast by Lano. I'm your host, Sandra, and as a freelancer myself who is working with clients all over the globe, I am experiencing the shift of work every day. So I'm super excited to explore the current and future state of work with you in this podcast. We will talk about the benefits, limitations, and solutions around remote and flexible work and explore many different ways to collaborate and work together. For this, I am chatting with business leaders, innovators, freelancers, and remote employees to learn firsthand how they manage their day-to-day life in an ever-changing and ever-evolving world. Mental health has become more and more important, especially over the last two years, and especially in the workplace. We need to break the stigma of asking for help when we need it, and companies need to show up to support their employees' mental well-being. That is exactly what I talked about with Eva Schneider, who is an ambassador for mental health with a special focus on workplace mental well-being. Her mission is to empower organizations to embed mental health into their work culture and provide a safe space for everyone to share how they are really feeling. In our chat, she shared her own experiences when working with companies and gave some real-life tips on how employers can support their workers to maintain good mental health and not just jump the gun when their employees are already in crisis. I see a lot of plants in the background. It looks very lovely where you are. Um, where are you joining us from today, Eva? I'm joining you from my beautiful uh, home office in the beautiful city of Berlin. I have many plants here uh, because it's uh, the nicest room in my apartment and, and I love to spend time here. So it's also good for my mental well-being um, to work in this lovely place here at my home. Yeah, that's a perfect way to start this episode because mental well-being is exactly what we're here to talk about today. Um, maybe you could give our listeners a quick little introduction into who you are and what it is that you do. Yes, uh, so uh, I'm Ava. I'm a psychologist and a psychotherapist, and I work with organizations to promote their mental well-being uh, and the mental well-being of their workforce. How important, from your opinion, ha is mental health in a workforce? And maybe also, how has that changed over the last couple of years? Mental health, like on a scale from one to 10, <laughs> mental health is uh, it has the importance of a 10, uh, I'd say. Um, if we look at it from a like very human perspective, yeah. um, people and your workforce are the core of your organization. It's the heart of your organization. So it only makes sense. It's only logical um, to invest in mental well-being because this way you invest in your workforce and in your people. Yes. Um, what we see today um, is that there's a lot of literature right now um, that it has very positive effects on retention, on absenteeism, presentism, productivity, the mm -hmm. culture. Um, and also we have very nice side effects, I'd say, um, on the employee experience, of course, and on employer branding, which is super important nowadays uh, where we really need to attract talent. Um, so um, mental health in general is like your insurance for the future because it directly addresses the people of your workforce. So um, it's definitely something that you need to look at and what will definitely also set you apart in the future from other companies that are not investing in mental well-being of their workforce. That's a good point. Do you see in your experience, do you hear from your clients and the companies you work with that employees are asking for mental health support? Definitely, yeah. And this has changed a lot uh, during the past years because people suddenly saw, okay, this is actually a topic. I mm -hmm. mean, everybody has mental health and everybody has had mental health 50 years ago as well. It was just not that much of a topic. Um, what we see today is that, especially during the past two years, people do not have this artificial separation between this is my private self and this is my work self anymore, um, but rather see themselves as whole person, which is yeah. only natural. You know, this before, before the pandemic, sometimes we had this artificial separation and people suddenly now see, okay, I'm a whole person. I bring my whole self to work. Yeah. Uh, and it's important for me to address this uh, with my employer as well. Yeah. So what we saw in the past two years is that we were all in collective stress. Everybody was subject to the corona crisis as people were suddenly confronted with working from home whilst caring for their families. They lost yeah. jobs. They maybe had to redesign their whole daily schedules, uh, couldn't do any leisure activities anymore. So mm -hmm. 
many things that we were used to and had like automatically in our daily lives, also social contacts or hobbies or physical activity, um, just f- were falling apart from yeah. one day to the other. And people were suddenly seeing, okay, this has effects um, on how I work, on my productivity, and also how we interact with each other, because everybody was feeling this collective stress. Um, yeah. So people were saying, okay, uh, this is actually a topic we want to address because we yeah. feel we're all in the same boat here and yeah. we can do something about this. So people were bringing up the topic a lot m- more often, mm-hmm. which is, I think is a very positive trend because, yeah. as I said, you do not have this artificial separation anymore that um, an employer says, okay, this is your work self here and go home to your private self and then yeah. recharge your batteries and come back with uh, full charged batteries and then do your work and then leave again and charge your batteries at home. But that we shift more to the perspective, okay, as a work place and as an employer we can actually take care of our employees to recharge their batteries during the workday as well by small tools tips hacks um, and also by investing in the culture um, of the company and do you think the pandemic has helped to break this stigma of taking care of your mental health yes and what I also see is that we still have a lot of stigma and there's a lot to be done in this field, but people feel or are more open to actually speak up about it. Um, even if it's only like a very tiny step and like mm-hmm. going to your team and one day you're saying, okay, guys, um, let's be honest here. How's everybody doing right now? Yeah. Um, just like doing those very teeny tiny small steps towards, okay, how's your emotional well-being? Have you been eating? Have you been sleeping? Um, what are the stresses that you're facing right now? And, yeah. and not only focusing so much on like work and tasks and projects, and but also on yeah. the human beings behind that. Um, and that you may have a different performance every day which is normal yeah when i sometimes i see in linkedin profiles people say i give a hundred percent every day (laughs) and then i'm always like well from a psychological perspective that's not really possible um so um people suddenly see okay this is okay that i mean people suddenly see that this is okay not to give a hundred percent each day, but this is actually normal Mm -hmm. and they bring up the conversation around it. And that is completely okay. And this is, I think, a very nice development that we see, okay, people are slowly uh, changing their conversations about well-being in a more holistic way, not only physical well-being, but also the mental well-being. And everybody does it in a little bit of their own style. Mm -hmm. But things are changing. However, there's still a lot of work to be done um, to reduce the stigma around mental health. You just mentioned that um, it's easier now or it's becoming easier for people to really check in with their employees, with their team members and to ask, how are you really doing? Um, I can imagine that this is easier to do when you work in an office together and harder to do if you have a remote team people working from home or people generally being distributed all over the world where you have maybe asynchronous conversations, you don't really get to check in as much as you would do maybe in person in an office. So do you think there's an even bigger focus or should there should be an even bigger focus on mental health in remote teams? The challenge that we have in remote teams that many parts of our usual like social interaction fall apart, like nonverbal cues, for example, yeah. because we only see a small excerpt from the person which is uh, sitting on the screen on the other yeah. side. Um, so what we really need to do here is to overcommunicate uh, a lot. We need to put a lot more into words. Um, it can be synchronous or asynchronous but we need to communicate explicitly a lot more than we are used to from usual social interactions, uh, face-to-face interactions. Mm -hmm. This is definitely something uh, which is super important for remote teams. Um, However, um, you just mentioned asynchronous um, communication. And um, what I observe is that often people see it as a disadvantage 
but mm -hmm. in my opinion this can also be a huge advantage because when we are for example looking at people who are more socially anxious yeah. and who feel very intimidated by direct face-to-face -face, um, interaction asynchronous communication can be such a relief for them because they might have some time to think about an answer to uh, yeah, g give themselves some space uh, which is something that, that we can really use um, as an advantage um, also mm -hmm. in remote teams so what I would like to say or to point out here is that we do not only have disadvantages when it comes to remote teams yeah. um, we also have many advantages um, in different ways However, in, in general, we always have this tension between this is great and this is also terrible at the same yeah. time. <laughs> so you have the advantage, of course, of like being more location independent, of attracting more talent globally. Um, so you can really build a great team um, who can also fit their workplace into their needs and mm -hmm. the lifestyle they wish to have. But of course, we also have a disadvantage that we lose some how some parts of the day-to-day -day communication that we might have um, in an office situation. So it's just good to be aware of the fact that we have a little bit of both worlds yeah. and that there are ways um, in both worlds um, where we can like strengthen the advantages and trying to minimize the disadvantages. Yeah, I, I love that concept, taking the strengths from from the situation that you have and, and focusing on that. Um, you mentioned the different character types or characteristics and personalities that are within a team. Some people might excel in asynchronous conversation or communication. Other people might really need the exchange, um, real-time exchange with their fellow colleagues or their superiors. Um, how can companies who do have an, a remote team make sure that each individual need of these people who, are addressed and that they're adapting their style of communication to meet those needs? It's a very good question. Um, and I think there is no one size fits at all. Um, it really depends on the size of the team, on the size of the company, also um, the number of locations and time zones uh, you're working in. Um, however, um, there are a few like very basic things that are super important. So um, general for mental health. So um, having kind of a regular schedule, for example, having regular mm -hmm. check-ins, that you have some kind of rhythm. Um, what you also have, of course, um, giving employees the flexibility to mm -hmm. work in their own style and their own working hours. Um, we also saw, especially within the past two years, that um, we do not need to stick to very rigid schedules. Yeah. That it's also a good approach uh, to give employees the own responsibility uh, to work, to, to design their um, work schedule however they wish to have it. Yeah. Um, apart from that, um, what is important next to the, the, the rhythm that we have in, in meetings and in interactions that we do not only fo focus on work stuff, um, as I said earlier, like the projects and the task management and the workload management um, and the timelines and so on, but also give an explicit focus to how are you doing? Um, yeah. How is your life looking right now? How do you um, switch off from work? So try to get a better understanding of the whole person um, and every part of the team, every person who is part of the team um, so that you have an idea of how does the environment of that person look like right now? Mm -hmm. um, because especially in the Corona pandem pandemic, we had some countries where there were super strict Corona regulations, other countries where there was, yeah, it was more liberal, <laughs> yeah. I'd say. Um, and this has a direct effect um, on how the uh, environment of that employee um, would look like. So, what I see here is that you do not only focus on work stuff, but you also focus on how does the environment of that specific person look right look like right now. Um, I can actually really relate to that because uh, we spoke about it a little bit before we hit record, but um, I experienced the lockdown in Australia, which was very restrictive and actually the international borders were closed. So I physically just couldn't leave the country, which probably sounds a bit weird to all the Europeans listening. 
And also, we have the phenomenon of having opposite summers and winters. So obviously, in summer, which is November to March in Australia, we were quite open. You know, the temperatures are warmer, the virus is not spreading as much. Um, and then in our winter, which is European summer, we were quite locked down and miserable. So it was always asynchronous in that sense for me to speak to my friends and about our experiences with the lockdown and with the virus, because we did experience the same emotions, but at different times and at different stages. And it made it quite difficult to relate to each other in a sense, I guess, or it just didn't make you share that information as easily. And I can imagine that's something that employees also feel. And I think it needs some getting used to, to actually share how you're really feeling um, with your team. So is that something where an external mental health professional like yourself could be beneficial because people maybe feel more comfortable disclosing their emotions to someone who's not their superior? Yes, definitely. So um, what I see is that it does make sense in any case uh, to really be open about how you are with your team, um, no matter if it feels a little bit different than from the rest of the team. Um, because if you're feeling lonely, if you're feeling isolated, if you're experiencing you have, have been more anxious uh, lately or have had trouble sleeping lately, this all will affect your work um, somehow. Um, and other, also you give other people and, and members from your team the chance to actually show that they care, you know, um, by holding back, you also take away the chance of your team to care for you and to develop an understanding for your situation, you know, so the little bit of responsibility is also always on the um, employee side. I think this is important for me to stress that you really need to speak up. You need, you, you cannot um, um, give the whole responsibility to the company only and say they have to do their part. You have to do your part as well. Uh, this is super important. Apart from that, um, having mental health professionals, so um, a coach, a counselor, a psychologist, a psychotherapist is definitely something I can highly recommend, no matter in which life situation you are, because it makes such a huge difference to talk to somebody neutral who is just there to listen to you. And we have that especially for team leads. Um, why is that the case? Because when you are taking care of so many people and we, when you are trying, trying to hold together the whole team, you also need somebody who takes care of you in a very neutral and just open sense and trying to help you with whatever your challenges are at the moment. So I can highly recommend to have a person um, on your side. Um, and uh, especially um, I can recommend companies to actually implement um, EIP systems or similar um, who give the opportunity to get help from an external person who is not tied to your company in some way to help you out with your very personal, private, specific um, challenges that you're facing right now. And this does not need to be a mental health issue right away, like um, going all the way into depression um, already, but it can also be just a professional to help you with maintaining your mental well-being. This is often a misconception that we have, that mental health is only, um, only comes into place when we want to cure depression or anxiety, but this is not true. Mental health is a lot about how can I foster and maintain a good mental well-being um, that it stays like this in the future as well. Yeah, very true. Is it like, as an analogy, you know, if you want to be physically fit and healthy, it's not enough to start working out when you break your leg. Yes. You actually have to work out before to make sure you don't actually break your leg. Exactly. Um, I like that, that image in my head. So we've talked about getting an external professional on board, establishing a team culture where it is encouraged to share how you're really feeling and you're an empowered to be honest and open and say that you need help or you're not feeling that great at the moment. Is there anything else that people or companies can do to support the mental well-being of their employees? 
Yes, absolutely. So when we uh, look at health promotion, we can separate it in two different fields. Um, one is behavior prevention. So in this field, we have like promoting healthy behavior around sleep, nutrition, physical exercise, um, and also uh, training leaders and teams in their knowledge and communication um, style. Um, we also have structural prevention, which points more to providing internal or external support systems, like I just mentioned, um, but also to the um, accessibility of health systems. What I see mm -hmm. very often in companies that they do have some kind of system, but nobody knows about it and nobody knows where to find it. So you really need easy access and also a safe access, because especially when mm -hmm. it comes to mental health, people often have concerns with anything related to privacy, because they say, mm -hmm. I really want to have a safe space for this um, topic. Um, so is it actually safe if I, I don't know, go um, to this and that person in my company and talk to that um, person? I mean, of course, it should be safe. Um, but I completely understand that sometimes there's this little feeling of, okay, am I actually safe here? And are my topics and concerns really treated safely um, mm -hmm. here? Um, also, what we have when it comes to structural prevention, um, that, of course, companies have the responsibility to create workload in a manageable way, to provide flexibility, to provide a clear schedule and expectations. Um, and also to provide um, health promoting equipment. If we are sitting on a wooden chair that just hurts uh, our backs, um, mm -hmm. this is not very sustainable, you know? Yeah. So um, this is something also where the company is responsible for it to provide the equipment um, and anything that is necessary to work in a healthy way. So these two aspects or these two areas um, are the areas that, that companies can look at, the behavioral prevention part, uh, where you look more at the people and their behavior um, and the structural mm -hmm. prevention part. Often what I see in companies is that they only put an emphasis on the behavioral prevention and say, oh, we have this yoga and meditation class. Why aren't you all super relaxed? <laughs> but this is only <laughs> one side of the medal, you know? Yeah. And this is only the part of, okay, we, we try to foster healthy behavior in some way, but you also need to take responsibility for the structural um, yeah. changes in your company and the structural setup in your company. You mentioned that privacy concerns might play a role in preventing people from taking advantage of mental well-being support for employees. What other challenges are there that you've experienced or that people have brought to your attention when it comes to taking advantage of these um, benefits of mental health, well-being. I'm thinking about, especially for remote and distributed teams, cultural differences might play a role and a factor in that as well. Is that what you've experienced too? Of course, mental health has huge cultural differences. So the perception of mental health has huge cultural differences. Um, so mental health is very prone to subjectivity. Mm -hmm. So in the US, for example, it's almost en vogue to go to therapy every week and yeah. everybody just talks about it in a super easygoing way. And um, then you might be going to China and people feel like assaulted when you ask them about how they are doing. Um, of course, this, this does not apply to everyone. And um, there, there are, um, yeah different shades, um, I'd say. Yeah. Um, but of course, cultural differences um, are a huge topic here. Uh, and you also need to be aware of that, that when you are asking people how they are doing, um, and like maybe also asking more private stuff, that you are always prepared to, okay, this, this might feel a little weird for that person, and that you try to verbalize that. So what yeah. you have, whatever the, the reaction might be, you can always say, okay, um, you do not have to answer that question. It's just for me that um, I'm, I care about you. I was concerned about how you are doing, uh, but I completely understand and it does not have any negative effects if you say you do not want to answer that question right now. You yeah. Know? So you can try to speak from your, your perspective as well, but try to see it more of a collection of experiences um, that mm -hmm. will come up over time where you get to know each other uh, better because it will come up at some point yeah. that 
people will say, okay, I just do not feel like talking about this right now. And then yeah. re just respect that. Um, and also try not to push people into anything, especially when it comes to cultural differences. You can be a role model. You know, you can say, hey, I'm feeling like this and that right now. And and they're trying to set a good example. Yeah. But do not expect people to adapt to your style of disclosing information or, or whatever you are sharing right now. Yeah. You know, respect their very own style of communication. Yeah, I actually have a quite a funny um, another Australian anecdote um, that <laughs> kind of relates to this topic. A friend of mine um, did a first aid class in Australia and she was told, you know, when you're a first responder and you're talking to someone who's been hurt, you go up and ask them, how are you doing? And because in Australia and actually a lot of English speaking countries, it's very normal to, you know, the how are you doing is, or how are you? How's it going? You just say that as kind of like a greeting mechanism. You don't actually ask how people are doing. So it's very normalized to just answer, yeah, good good, how about yourself? You know, it's very intrinsic in people's behaviors to just respond with good. So when there's someone lying on the floor who's been had fallen off their bike or been hit by a car and the first responder comes and asks, how are you doing? They are, they're told to ask that question twice because the first reply might be, yeah, good, because they're just automatic. used to saying that. It's an automatic response and just say, okay, but how are you really feeling? Because you just mm -hmm. fell off your bike, yes. um, which is, a cultural thing that I also had to learn and I had to adapt to being a German living in Australia. I'm not used to that. I'm thinking people ask me how I am all the time, but it's just a matter of greeting, um, which Germans have their own ways of greeting and, you know, all these different little cultural differences that definitely make a difference when communicating with people from different backgrounds. So being aware Absolutely. of that, I can definitely yes. see it helping. Yes. Yes. And also you pointed to a very uh, interesting thing right now um, that you sometimes um, need to communicate whatever you were observing and all mm -hmm. the, the behavior you were ex observing, because do not jump to any conclusions, uh, but try to be open for whatever that person might have to say, but yeah. only share what you just did observe. So for example, I just observed you were like falling off your bike. Um, I am wondering like, Uh, how are you doing? Because I, I saw you were like falling on your shoulder. And yeah. how does that feel? Did you fall on your head? Yeah. Are you okay? You know, so share share your observations and based on that, be open for an answer, but do not jump to conclusions uh, right and straight away uh, because this mm -hmm. will, will probably be toxic in the long run, especially when we're talking about mental health in the workplace. Yeah. So a quick look to the future. Um, in your opinion, what's what's going to happen in the space of mental health i feel like the last two years have really broken open this this space for people to talk about how they're really feeling with their employers with their colleagues um, where do you see that developing to in the future i believe that we will definitely more and more discover the advantages of technology in that field um that we will have access to mental health support um, in a time and location independent way, which mm -hmm. is a very nice development, I think, because it really bridges the gap between, okay, I need some support. Uh, for some reason, I cannot go to a face-to-face -face, uh, psychologist, for example, uh, to get help. So what can I do instead? And mm -hmm. technology and mental health support that works for example, online can definitely bridge that gap. And I think we will massively move towards support in the more technological uh, direction mm -hmm. um, and move a little bit away from the classical and traditional understanding of face-to-face -face support. Um, also, I see that employers will take a lot more responsibility in that field, also because employees are really asking for this. Because when mm -hmm. you have two new potential employee um, because when you have two new potential employers and you should decide which one you would go to and the conditions are kind of the same but mm -hmm. one place invests into mental well-being and the other place doesn't my decision would be pretty clear yeah so what i said earlier mental health and investing into mental health is an insurance for the future and it's the insurance for your workforce 
So this is definitely something where we will move to when it comes to organizational um, mental well-being. Um, apart from that, when we look at the culture, um, I also see that people are stepping up more and talk about the topic. They bring the topic more to the table and they also feel and for them, it's also easier to express what might be tough at the moment yeah. or what might be something that two years ago they would not have felt so comfortable talking about. Yeah. So I think that's a very nice development in many areas. However, there's still a lot to be done, um, especially mm -hmm. around the topic of stigma, because people still have many misconceptions about mental health um, or also mental health issues when it's a more severe um, case. Mm -hmm. For example, people often think when you have a mental health issue, um, you will be like sick for the rest of your life. And this is just mm -hmm. not true. They often also connect um, mental health issues with words like crazy or so mm -hmm. so i think there's still a lot to be done in the wording also and also in the mental health literacy so really knowing the numbers knowing the facts like being clear about what mental health is and what it also is not yeah i think this is definitely something where we will move to and hopefully i really really hope that um, that people like me won't be necessary in the future anymore and that we will have a workplace where we can work in a fruitful and health promoting way and where we yeah. do not need to be anxious about um, stepping up, up about our mental well-being or talking about uh, our last um, psychotherapy session which was super enlightening um, yeah. so this is something that I really wish for in the future. Yeah. I think what you really show is that it doesn't need to be a negative. We can take see this as a positive mm -hmm. thing. It's adding to our experience as employers and as humans and as employees. Um, and it's creating shared experiences. And we can take some of the advantages of our situation and just really focus on them and not focus so much on the disadvantages. And yeah, cater to the strength of your situation. I think that's what I've definitely taken away from our talk the most. So I really want to thank you for taking your time to talk about this topic, to shine some light on it and to, yeah, bring some positivity in this space as well and make sure that people understand what mental health is about and what it's not about. So thank you for that. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Have a good day. The State of Work is a podcast by Lano and is available wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us at Instagram or Twitter by searching for The State of Work. For more information about today's topic and links to further reading, check out our show notes at lano.io slash podcast. Thanks for listening and until next time on The State of Work.